Shalom. This is Reverend John Ferret, and we are continuing in the new podcast series called The Fall Feast of Adonai. And now we're at part two on the Feast of Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonements. And again, it's not a feast, as it is an appointed time. Now, in episode one, we learned that Yom Kippur is really Yom Kippurim. It's a day of atonements. We mistakenly call it Yom Kippur. And this appointed time does not forgive, cleanse, or atone the sins of Israel. Any sins. The great rabbis like Akiva and Maimonides, as we studied in episode one, agree with the writer of Hebrews that there's no sacrifice or no ritual that can take away our intentional sins. So we needed to understand, as in episode one, unintentional sin and intentional sin as it occurs in the Torah. Intentional sin is the concept that Christians normally understand. Yom Kippurin only deals with unintentional sin. Because on Yom Kippurin, as we're going to study later on in episode three, deals with the sin sacrifice. We've got to come back to that again. But now, we're going to continue. And we're going to recall the very words of God, where Jesus said in John 5.39, that you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is these that testify of me. And he says this between 24 to 30 AD, and the only Bible that they had when Jesus said this was the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And the primary books of the Hebrew Scriptures then was the Torah. Now there's another verse that I want to take a look at that is also critical to this. Paul talks about the feasts in Colossians 2, 16 through 17. He says this, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food, or drink, or in respect to a festival, in other words, an appointed time, the appointed time of the Lord, or a new moon, or the Sabbath, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. These are shadows of things to come. And it's interesting because he then uses this phrase, but the substance, the substance of what? Of the shadow, belongs to Messiah belongs to Christ. So it's as if out of these feasts a shadow comes. And it's the shadow of Jesus himself. Not only over us, but the shadow coming out of the feasts. Coming out of God's appointed times that we read about in Leviticus 23. So again, we ask the question, where is Yeshua in the feast? How is it that the feasts, the the appointed times of the Lord, testify of Jesus? How is he the shadow of the feasts? But then again, a second important point is this. What about the disciples of Jesus in the first century? They were with him for a number of years. And so... When they're looking at the feasts, at the appointed times, especially after Jesus rose from the dead, especially after Jesus ascended to the heaven, especially after the Feast of Shavuot Pentecost, when 3,000 were added to the assembly, how did they start looking at the feast? They were remembering Jesus' words that all Scripture testifies of Him. So therefore... How does Yom Kippurim testify of Jesus? Now, when we take a look historically at how Israel actually perhaps did this feast, prior to 586 BC, we asked the question was it practiced by the Hebrews? in the 40 years in their desert wanderings? It's probably safe to assume the answer is yes. Why? Well, it's Moses. He was considered prophet, priest, and king. And he said he was to be teacher of the Torah to his people. We can read this in Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 5. 
reading from the New American Standard, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform. This is Moses saying this. So that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it. You may keep the commandments, so that you may commit the, keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord has done in the case of ba Baal Peor, for all the men who followed Baal Peor. The Lord God has destroyed them from among you. But you are, but you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, even one, every one of you. See, I have taught you the statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So it seems as if, based upon what we read, we really get a sense that it's probably quite likely that they did this appointed time of Yom Kippurim for those 40 years in their wanderings before they entered the Promised Land. But then they do enter the Promised Land, and it's after Joshua and that third generation basically completes the conquest. We read in Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 10, that the third generation, the third generation turned from God, all of them. And the Bible implies that no feasts were done until King Josiah in 649 to 609 BC. You can read about that. Look up King Josiah and especially when they found the Torah scroll. When he asked the high priest to go find it, they weren't doing the feast. Now there's got to be a small group of Hebrews then that were, were doing this and it seems as if we're going to be focusing on a David and Solomon especially in Jerusalem it's likely that David and his son Solomon would have practiced the atonement rituals one might also assume that this carried on through the history to 586 BC when the temple was destroyed the first temple but once again the Bible's silent there's nothing definite that can be concluded after the second temple is built in 516 BC and that second temple goes all the way to 70 AD so obviously close to 600 years this is called the second temple period the appointed time of Yom Kippurim was clearly practiced devoutly and like I said this is called the second temple period period and probably Yom Kippurim was restarted under Ezra after the Babylonian exile. This is from a book on Jewish history. Matter of fact, it's from a website, jewishhistory.com, on Ezra and Nehemiah. Reading from their website, ultimately Ezra and Nehemiah called a convention and administered what became known as the Covenant of Faith. This is Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 10. The people read from the book of Deuteronomy, which describes all the laws and ideals they were not giving, not living up to. And they all wept and repented and agreed to uphold the Torah from then on. See, agreed to uphold the Torah. That means Yom Kippurim, especially to observe the Sabbath, bringing the tithes and the donations to the temple and refrain from intermarriage. So again, Ezra, Nehemiah at that time, it is quite likely that they reinstituted the practice of Yom Kippurim. In Jesus' day, this appointed time was practiced devoutly. It was known as the day or the great day. If you remember Paul's trip on the uh, ship where they were shipwrecked, shipwrecked, you can read this in Acts 27 verse 9. It was at the time after the fast, which is another way that it, the, the Feast of Yom Kippurim, Kippurim was known. It's clearly written in the works of Josephus. He writes about the practices uh, of Yom Kippurim in detail. And you can look this up in his writings, The Antiquities of the Jews, Book 3, Chapter 10, Paragraph 3, to, to be precise. And also in the Jewish Talmud, in Tractate Yoma. 
So for me, my major resources are not only Josephus, not only the Talmud, but a fantastic book put together by Israel Arial and Chaim Rechman from the Temple Institute in Jerusalem, and it's called Carta's Illustrated Encyclopedia of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. This is a fantastic work. And when you actually go in there and you compare it to your reading of Josephus, you'll find that they agree, except that what Israel Ariel and Chaim Rickman did in this Carta's Illustrated Encyclopedia, the, the drawings are fantastic. The artwork is just beautiful. Another one is uh, Samuel Shafrai's book, The Jewish People in the First Century, Volume 1 and 2, an unbelievable scholarly work that talks about the Jewish people in the first century and all aspects of their culture, especially, obviously, their practice of the appointed times that we find in Leviticus 23. Now, after the temples destroyed in 70 AD, everything changes. There's no temple. And as we're going to find in episode 3, in Jesus' day, Yom Kippurim was all about the temple. Temples destroyed, 70 AD. Now this is the time at the beginning of rabbinic Judaism. Everything changed. Yom Kippurim became an appointed time that was done 100% in the synagogue. And the rabbis revised and rethought their whole approach to the Torah and the appointed times at this time. So all of a sudden, things really changed in terms of their practice. Yom Kippurim became a total fast, no food or drink for 24 hours, no sex, no shoes. It's just... Now, the Bible doesn't say that. It says afflict yourself, but you have to understand that the total fast for 24 hours... And then to refrain from marital sex and not wearing leather and all sorts of stuff. That is really afflicting yourself. There's evening services on the evening of Yom Kippurim. So sundown happens and then they have their evening services and people are dressed in white. They're dressed in a kittle, as it's called. It's a long white shirt symbolizing a burial shroud. And it's a reminder of one's mortality and the need for teshuva, a need for repentance. There's a second service during the day on Yom Kippurim known as Ne, I think I'm pronouncing it right, Neila, runs about an hour long. And it's a service symbolizing the closing of the gates of heaven. And as the new day begins at sundown, they have a large, joyous meal, breaking the fast. And at that time, they look forward to the next Feast of Sukkot, which is going to be next in this series. So this is not an easy day for religious Jewish people today. Jewish people are saying that as they practice Yom Kippurim today, it shows the horror of sin and its consequences. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it in Christianity. Lent doesn't even come close to this one unamazing day among the Jewish religious believers in Judaism. Now in rabbinic Judaism, there's a lot of rabbinic commentary and midrash, and that is studying the feasts, studying the Bible, and giving us ideas of what this possibly is all about. They say this is the last chance. It isn't the last chance. They know Yom, Kree, Yom Kippurim is going to be every year, but it represents the last chance. There's going to be a day when the last great shofar is going to be blown. Like in Rosh Hashanah, three books are open, they say. That's not in the Bible. This is all made up by the rabbis, but it's really interesting. Three books are opened on Rosh Hashanah because they remember that on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Teruah, they remember the blast of the shofar and they know that there's going to be one great last blast of the shofar at the end of days when Messiah is going to come and then judgment's going to happen. There's three books open 
the book of life, the book of death, and the book of in-betweens. Which book are you written into? If you're in the book of death, boy, you better... <laughs> you say, I want to get out of here. I need to repent and come to the Lord and seek for him to save me from my sin and atone for my sin and forgive me. If you're in the book of in-between, you're not in the book of life and you're not in the book of death, you only have this last chance. So the courts are in session and judgment is going to happen. Now Yom Kippurim, when we read it in the Bible, doesn't talk about a day of judgment. This is the way the rabbis look at it. This is the meaning that they started putting onto this appointed time after 70 A.D. Now with regards to this last great shofar blast, after 70 A.D. and for decades and decades after, the rabbis came up with this plan. They said, all right, uh, Rosh Hashanah is one day and it begins on the new moon of the seventh month, but what if people can't see the new moon because it's cloudy in their area, so therefore we're going to extend Rosh Hashanah to day number two. Now again, I, I have a lot of trouble with this, and I have Jewish scholars that have trouble with this. This is not biblical. They're basically saying that the second day of Rosh Hashanah, which they made up, is just as valid and just as holy as the one that God said, which is day one of the seventh month. But regardless, because we know in Judaism that the Talmud, where obviously a lot of this is written, the rabbinical midrashim, we might say, the rabbinical views and comments on this, in Judaism, the Talmud is held at the same level as the Bible. So it's almost as if in Judaism, they're saying the rabbi's word is just as powerful as God's word. And I, as a Christian, I'm saying, I'm sorry, I can't agree with that. However, I want you to see this because this gets very interesting because it's related to us. So they say, we've got these 10 days. You've got the first day of the, uh, of the seventh month, Tishri, and that's Rosh Hashanah. And we count to the 10th day, and the 10th day is Yom Kippurim. But like I said, they have this second day, the second day of the month of Tishri. So if you can see uh, a number line, and you got the numbers 1 through 10, you could say, okay, day 1 and day 2 are Rosh Hashanah, and day 10 is Yom Kippurim. So we got seven days in the middle. Seven days. Now the rabbis jumped on this immediately, and they said, yes, we know what this represents. Judgment is coming. We know that this, all of this is a picture of the end of times when Messiah is going to come. These seven days represent the, the, the final week in, David's, uh, in Daniel's 70-week prediction of, the, of, of world history. And you can read about that in Daniel 9, verse 24, about the 70 weeks. And it's 70 weeks of years. Each week, obviously, represents seven years. Daniel 9.27, it's the last week. And in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. And so they're saying, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim, these seven days represent a picture of the time of Jacob's trouble. So indeed, atonement has come. Judgment has come, actually, not atonement. And the books are closed, and the heavenly gates are shut. It reminds us of Luke 13, 23 to 28, of those who take the wide road or those who take the narrow road. Those who take the wide road will be shut out when the gates are closed. But all of this seems connected to Rosh Hashanah. We remember Rosh Hashanah, actually Yom Teru is the day of remembering the blast, remembering the shofar blast. Here we have the rabbis talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. Here we have them talking about the last great shofar blast. We talked about this in the three sessions, especially in the third session, on Yom Teruah, as you know it as Rosh Hashanah. 
what shofar is connected to Yeshua? He said it in his own words. This is in Matthew 24. He talks about the great shofar blast as, as related to his return. And his disciples knew about this. They heard his words. And Jesus, in his own words, the very words of God, reminds us of this last great shofar. And he says, he will gather his elect, his, the Jew and Gentile, both flocks, because we're grafted in, we're joint heirs in Israel. And in Deuteronomy and Ezekiel, it talks about the fact of being gathered in at the end of days, the ingathering of Israel. And Jesus says, I will gather my elect. He uses the very word. And Ezekiel talks about being taken, being taken up, being taken to Jerusalem. And the word there is seized, snatched away, to be captured. This is the same word that Paul uses in Greek in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. The Greek word there is harpazo, and some people say it's raptured. No, it's not. That's, that's Latin. Rapture comes from the Latin, and guess what it means in Latin? To be seized, to be taken away. Just as we read about the Hebrew in Deuteronomy and Ezekiel, that the elect of God will be gathered in the end of days and taken up, and taken up to be with their Lord forever in the new Jerusalem. My goodness, this sounds like the Jewish rapture. It sounds like what Paul was talking about is not the Christian rapture, but something that was very, very easily understood by Jewish people in the first century. So Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, the day of the Shofar blast, and on that day, we are under the shadow of Messiah. And what are we to remember? We remember the day of the Lord. After the tribulation. We remember the day of the Lord after Jacob's trouble. This is the day of the great shofar blast. For the Jewish people, they're saying Messiah will come. For Christians, they would say, Messiah is returning. But now, we're studying Yom Kippurim. The message is hurry and repent. Seek God's atonement for your sins because sometime the books, the books are going to be closed. The book of life will be closed. The book of death will be closed. And the book of in-between, if you're in that book, if you're in that book and the great shofar blows and the gates are closed, anybody in the book of in-between automatically goes into the book of death. This is amazing. Could it be that God is using these rabbinic ideas and views along with Christian concepts that we know in the New Testament to prepare all of us for his return? So indeed, as we actually see how the rabbis talk about the fact that between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim, there were the seven days, the last week, the time of Jacob's trouble. And for us Christians, that last week, the last seven years of Daniel's prediction of the 70 weeks, in our Christian view, we call it the time of the Great Tribulation. And at the end of that Great Tribulation, at the time of the end of the tribulation, the time of the end of Jacob's trouble, there will be a great shofar blast. And Yeshua HaMashiach will return. Jesus the Messiah will return. And so, Yom Kippurim is a reminder that the seven days of Jacob's trouble, the last week of Jacob's trouble, those seven years, they're coming. It's a time of repenting repenting now. Yom Kippurim is a picture of the Day of Judgment. Shalom. And for us Christians, that last week, the last seven years 
of Daniel's prediction of the 70 weeks. In our Christian view, we call it the time of the Great Tribulation. 